Welcome to Sunday Morning Bible Study with Pastor Zemke. This podcast is the weekly digital way to be involved in the Prince of Peace Bible Study. Whether you're at home, in the car, or wherever else you might be, we invite you to join us in studying God's Word. Welcome back to the Gospel of Mark. Today we're going to have a time in Mark chapter 4. So this is one of two teaching sections in the Gospel of Mark. Mark is a little bit longer of a um, story, and you just get the story from Mark instead of these longer teaching sections. Uh, here I'm contrasting Matthew's uh, Sermon on the Mount, Luke's Sermon on the Plain, or a lot of the teaching that you would get uh, in parables and those sorts of things from um, Matthew and Mark during the um, Holy Week sort of thing, and some of those are in Mark, uh, but not all of them. Uh, so chapter four is unique along with chapter 13. The story is interrupted here for some teaching time. Uh, and so we'll get some of the most famous parables, or we'll get the most famous parable right off the bat here uh, in terms of Christian inside the church. Maybe it's not the most most um, famous parable ever in terms of, of American society. That's probably the prodigal son um, or the good Samaritan, those two. Uh, but the parable of the sower is certainly uh, famous and quite prominent inside of Christian theology. Uh, we'll have a little Mark and Sandwich in the midst of this, uh, and that Mark and Sandwich will be a uh, parable interrupted by a quotation from Isaiah that is the key to understanding all of Mark's gospel on uh, the insider-outsider deal and the unrevealed Christ and all of that. So stay tuned. Uh, we will get into the text. All right. So what you see before you right here is my own translation. And I thought for a little part of this podcast, I do a little bit of my translation work. It takes a little bit more time uh, and but you get a sense of the text, and I thought here uh, you can see my own work here. Um, and you'll see what the Greek is really like when you don't clean it up and make it nice English. So beginning at verse 1. Again he began to teach beside the seas, and a huge throng closed in around him, so that he boarded a boat and sat on the sea. And the whole throng was next to the sea on the earth. And he began to teach them in many parables, and he began to teach them his teachings. Okay, that's a little weird. Um, that's really uncleaned up. Um, but, uh, and we'll see here, I'm going to do a little bit more translation work for you guys in the next slide, I think, um, to really point something out here. But um, I wanted to give a little bit of taste of, of how Mark is in its own Greek. So here's the again, um, or and, uh, he began to teach. So this is a nice little piece here. Um, Mark is using a lot of, for this chapter, a lot of imperfect verbs. So this is past tense with some extra stuff included in it. Uh, and it's fine, right? That's how you would, so the, the real way to translate, there are very wooden ways, and he taught. But the imperfect has a sense where you get to add a little bit of extra stuff. He began to teach beside the sea. So the sea here is um, the Sea of Galilee. Um, it's pluralized here um, just because. Um, so we've got the, he, <laughs> that's how it, it went. Um, so then this is not usually how it's translated. A huge throng closed in around him. Um, but that's a little bit more the idea in the Greek. This is not, usually this is just like a crowd pressed him or, or something. Um, let's see what the ESV says. Um, a very loud crowd crowd gathered around him. Well, yeah, but uh, if you remember one or two of, uh, podcasts ago, I was talking about this, how um, the idea of queuing up is not native to um, the ancient world. So nobody's getting in a nice line. There are not orderly ranks. Um, these are people pushing and jostling and trying to get the best view of Jesus. Um, and we have this really kind of... Uh, sense of they're pushing and pushing. And the only reason he gets in the boat is 
because nobody's going to get their feet wet. There's a natural barrier there. Jesus doesn't want to stand there for hours in up to his knees. And if he gets his feet wet, other people will get his, their feet wet. If he gets in the boat, that's a signal to everybody that um, you all just stand on the shore, however you're going to stand there, and then we will just take care of this. Um, so we end up in this spot here where Jesus is in a boat. Um, and literally, this is, and he sat on the sea. Um, people reading Greek don't really have this. It's a little bit more, um, uh, shall we say, um, fussy to say, and it's cleaned up in English. And he sat in the boat, and, um, or he sat in the boat. Uh, but really, what are you doing? You're sitting on the water. And people can really uh, appreciate what's going on here in the Greek. So this is one of the reasons I wanted to do a little translation for you. Um, and the whole throng was next to the sea on the earth. Well, yeah, there's a little bit of woodenness to this, right? And they're on the ground or they're on the land and he's on the sea. Uh, but in a little bit more formal translation, they're on the earth and he's on the water. There's this separation thing going on. And Mark is being a little, you know, he's telling it how it happened, but he's also letting you kind of have this picture of the separation. Uh, and he wants to make a little bit more uh, out of this. Um, a few notes here about verse one um, here that we can talk about. Uh, so we've got the, the thing that he's doing. Um, and uh, so he's in the Sea of Galilee, and there's a little part called the Bay of Parables um, inside the Sea of Galilee. It's been named that by Christian archaeologists or Christian topographers. Uh, but there's a kind of a natural amphitheater sort of formation on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and they've gone out and tested this to see how hearing is. So if you've ever wondered, how is it that Jesus teaches from a boat? Uh, well, um, he's got the, the land is actually helping him out here. The, this, the way of the land is the topography is helping him. So people can kind of stack themselves back up here, uh, and, um, they can see what's, uh, see what's happening because the land rises up. Uh, and then they can hear him quite clearly. And Jesus doesn't have to shout. Jesus uses a loud voice, but he doesn't have to shout. Um, if you've ever been out at night, you know, when things get a little more quiet, sometimes you can hear voices from quite a distance away. Uh, I remember one time when I was working at at summer camp on the lake, we could actually hear a conversation that was being had uh, on the other side of the bay um, because everything was still and these folks were using louder voices and kind of, you know, you'd catch things, you know, and this was not being helped by the topography and they were quite a ways away. Uh, so um, that's, that's what's going on in, in verse one. Um, and then I wanted to do verse two in the Greek because this is just kind of uh, fun, but also a little wooden. Um, and he began to teach them in many parables, and he began to teach them his teachings. Um, so again, it's a little repetitive uh, in English, but in Greek, this would just be fine. A sense of starting out and starting out to teach uh, is where you would get. So uh, again, if you want a clean version of this, it's, and he was teaching them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, um, that's fine. That's not you know, exactly formally where the text went. Um, I'm fine with that cleaned up translation. That's the English Standard Version, if you would like. Um, that That's great, but cleared up here, uh, he began to teach them in many parables, and he began to teach them his teachings or his doctrines or uh, didache here uh, is just the teachings. Um, so the, the teaching, the didache, didasco, or um, that kind of uh, verb there, um, you teach your teachings, but in English we would say something um, something else reinforcing that idea. Um, so it is a little strange. Uh, again, here I need to note uh, that parable here is a technical word. Um, and when we get into the parable, I'll talk a little bit more about what we might want to say about 
parables. But at this point here, and in just a few minutes, we'll actually have a little bit longer conversation after we read the first part of the parable. But in this part here, suffice to say that parable is non, uh, non-literal speech. In uh, Mark, the Mark has more stories, uh, and so the idea of Jesus telling stories that have uh, separate meanings, whether they're um, fables or allegories or um, parables, or there's just a moral to the story, um, or you know, we could go through a lot of these. Uh, you you get the idea here, uh, but there's a parable is a bigger category, uh, and Mark uses parable here, and he's got some some stories, but sometimes he's got a simile, sometimes he's got a um, metaphor uh, and um, that Jesus is going to use and this is just like how how it goes and they really don't worry about having these formal categories um, these are something that English speakers have uh, as we describe different types of speech and in a, it's a very modernist sort of thing um, in Jesus day saying parable uh, would mean any kind of, of literary device or any kind of of um, sort of rhetorical device too because Jesus isn't writing the Gospels uh, Jesus is speaking they're recording so sometimes Jesus is using rhetorical devices like similes metaphors allegories those kinds of things uh, or ad hominems right where he's calling people names and and uh, you know saying you brood of vipers uh, and sometimes he's got a little bit of a time where he he tells a story uh, and so Mark will give us those literary, the literary device here will be the sandwich, but the rhetorical devices are parables. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind here um, as we go through, go through this, this uh, little parable of the sower. All right, so now we're into verse three and the actual meat of the parable. And so Jesus says, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not give up much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it out, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell onto good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So here is the actual parable of the sower. Uh, you know it, you love it. We'll dive in here. Okay, so up in verse three at the top of the slide or at the top of the new thingy, uh, however this renders, it says, listen, uh, this is a third person plural imperative. Um, and then, so that's all of this, like, uh, the word for here in Greek is not listen, it's hear. Um, and there's a difference. You can listen and not really understand. You can listen and it sounds like Charlie Brown's teacher, if you're of the age to have seen Charlie Brown and seen him in school and seen how his teacher does. Um, and then you can listen and intentionally forget. And so, um, what this really is, is hear in Greek, hear and understand. And there's a cognitive piece or a spiritual piece in this case to listening or hearing that we're going to be uh, looking for understanding and not just for understanding, but for um, taking this in and making it one of our own or making it into ourselves. So uh, he says, listen and behold, um, the behold here though is, uh, not third person plural. It's third person singular. Uh, so this is his, um, his, uh, way to start the story. Uh, so behold really is a once upon a time move here. Um, so that's kind of how this, how this rolls out. If you've ever wondered about the, the listen and behold thing, uh, he's got to start the story somehow. Uh, and so he doesn't have once upon a time, um, he uses the word behold, which is a throwback to, um, old Testament prophecies, um, which use the word behold, uh, in Hebrew a lot. Uh, and so Jesus is having sort of a, a prophetic sort of thing, uh, here as he tells the prophecy. So, um, we've got the, uh, 
the sower and um this is hand broadcasting. So the uh, many of you will have done this, but only with grass seed, right? And we don't really care. We want the grass seed to come in, but it's a process. And we know because it's a whatever perennial or whatever we're going to call that, um, we know that it, it um, doesn't really matter if we get a nice thick uh, crop that first year. It'll grow in. It'll be fine. Uh, and we've got another bag, and we're not using it for food production. And so we can come back and do what's called overseeding and, and all these things. But uh, in the ancient world, they don't have seed drills. They don't have tractors. And they are not um, – they don't have time or energy to do um, – uh, farming and seed production, right? Where you poke a hole with a stick and you put your little baby seed down in there and then you gently cover it up. Um, they don't have time for that. And that works for things like corn. Uh, it does not work for grain. Uh, and grain is kind of picky. So the sower goes out and broadcasts seed much like you would broadcast seed when you're sowing out grass seed. That is, you take a handful of seed out of the bag and you just kind of sprinkle it on the ground. Uh, there's evidence to suggest that um, they used to plow after sowing. So you'd plow the field, you'd sow the field, and then you'd plow it. And so you don't necessarily know what soil is under and if you've got in the margins or if you've gone into the ditch a little too far. Um, you don't know what the soil underneath is like because you haven't cultivated it. And why they're doing this is um, the same reason that it's good practice to rake over your grass seed uh, when you have planted it or to put some straw over it or something to hide the seed from the majority of the birds who are going to come and eat your whole lawn. Okay, so uh, they have a little too much sun, they have a little too much heat, and they have birds. And so they want to come and select it up. Um, uh, and then we want to cover it up. So there is good evidence to suggest that they are... Um, coming back right after they've sowed and plowing it in the same day. So don't worry about, oh, they're going to wreck it. No, no, they're, they're just doing this in, in a little bit. Um, so uh, notice here that, uh, and commenters are pretty quick to point this out, um, he wastes three quarters of his seed which is common, right? Uh, today, we would never put up with production levels that bad. Uh, and it's one of the one of the main reasons that we've been able to feed the world, right? We invented the tractor, we invented row planting and row farming, we, we invented, uh, or we have taken advantage of these things. Uh, and then that's not even talking about fertilizer, crop rotation and hybridization for maximum yield. Okay, so we've got all these fancy technical things that farmers today do, uh, they don't have access to this. So it's common for you to lose three quarters of your seed. Uh, and Jesus hasn't gotten into other ways your crops can fail. It's planted too close. It's been shaded out. It was rotten seed. He'll do that, a little of that, uh, in the parable of the weeds, which is in, if I'm not mistaken, in a different gospel. Um, but just know you're only getting a 25% return. Okay, I'm pretty sure I did the math wrong. You're losing three quarters of your seed. There we go. Um, percentages and going down versus up. I just math, not my not my forte. But we all get this. Three quarters is not going great. For the purposes of this parable, it's important to point out yield. Um, in the ancient world, uh, if you got fifteen percent yield, um, you were doing really good, uh, and that throws into account, uh, or 15 times, um, 15 fold. That's the kind of yield you would be expecting at 15%, uh, 15 fold. Uh, sorry there. Um, you, that's exactly what you're, you're looking for. That's a good year. Uh, and so every seed you put in that takes off gives you 15 grains back. Um, and again, this is before hybridization, so all the seeds or corns or whatever you want to call them, all of them are seed stock. You don't have to buy from the grain from the um, from the uh, Asgro uh, or um, one of the other big seed suppliers. Um, so when Jesus says uh, thirtyfold, uh, that's enormously good. That's nearly ne unheard of. Um, you know, sometimes, but on average is 15 fold. So 30 is just like stupendous. And when he says 60 fold and 100 fold, it's just mind blowing. They're farmers, they know what 
what's up. They know how things are generally supposed to go. And so for Jesus to say uh, 60 or 100 fold, it, that's where the parable breaks the mold. Everybody, um, and if you've been to enough church services and, and sermons on the parable of the sower, everybody spends a lot of time del- uh, kind of plumbing the depths or uh, <laughs> in terms of now, who are these people? Let me try to characterize the people who are in the rocky soil or who are growing up amongst the thorns. Um, and they, they really try to go down deep and try to nail people. And I think you're one of the people down in the thorns, or I think you're a rocky soil Christian. And um, in some ways, that breaks the parable. Um, because if you're going to do this sort of thing, um, y- if that's how you are, then you're stuck. And if you're a Calvinist church body, then you are well and truly stuck, and and it's too bad, and and you're just going to go to hell later, um, and that's fine. Um, it's, it's not fine, but um, and I'm oversimplifying the Calvinist position, but I'm Lutheran, and it's my podcast, so there you go. Um, so if we're going to go down that road, right in the parable, you're stuck. And you need to clean things up. I will say for the um, the growing up amongst thorns, those people, if we're going to go this way, really do seem stuck, right? Their circumstances are against them. Uh, fate or whatever we want to say or bad decision making or maybe just heroin. Um, sorry, I went for the drug of choice there. Um, it's making a resurgence. Don't do heroin. Um, that has... Um, uh, so we can really see that. Uh, or maybe if you're trying to become a Christian in the midst of an abusive, alcoholic sort of family uh, household situation, there again. Um, and it, to that extent, it's going to be really hard to uproot yourself and move yourself to good soil, in quotes, right? But why I say that this breaks the parable and you know, because Jesus goes and explains the parable on the other side of the sandwich. And so we're stuck again with Jesus. I shouldn't say stuck, but we're we're left with Jesus' interpretation of the parable and what he meant. Uh, And a lot of people say, oh, look, great. Jesus explained it. Now all I have to do is preach it. Um, And so we get these, and you'll have to just excuse me. I do this for a living, right? Uh, I write sermons. I write professional nonfiction. Um, and creatively. Uh, so sitting through these um, is kind of boring and difficult for me because this is not the point of the parable. The point of the parable uh, is to is not to pigeonhole the entire church and say you're in one of these drawers and if you're not in the good soil drawer, you either need to get over here or depending on your church body, you're just stuck and we're not going to waste time or effort or money or, or <laughs> resources on you because you're going to fall away eventually anyway. Um, to their credit, I have never seen a pastor who said, well, you're in, not even a Calvinist pastor, you're in this category and that's where God puts you and you just need to keep it there and God will God'll deal with you later. Um, so at least they have good pastoral care, even if they don't have great homiletical skills. Uh, and yes, that was a slam against these sorts of, of deep delving kind of, of um, sermons. The point here of the parable is to break the model about how God works in the world. And that is to say that God takes all of our expectations, upends them, and brings in new metrics, right? We're expecting 15-fold and God gives us 30, 60, or 100-fold. That's the point of the parable. The kingdom of God is like uh, and he's beginning to teach them this is what you should be able to expect from your God, not just a little bit and enough to get by, although there's something to be said for teaching contentment um, in a world that has gone quickly awry and has a sense of entitlement. Uh, we've kind of swung the other t- the other way a little too far. Um, but there is a sense to talk through this and to say, now, you're not expecting enough out of God in your life. Uh, we expect too much from him in terms of material possessions and not enough in terms of spiritual growth and health and comfort and peace and all of those things. Remember, this is the God who opened the Red Sea. This is the God who held back the waters of the Jordan. And this is the God who made the sun stand still. 
So when Jesus tells the parable, the parable is not to try to figure out new converts and or not to try to sort the church. The parable is designed to upend every single person's uh, expectations of what God can and should and, and is supposed to be doing. And so to the extent that we have the parable of the sower, and I think I've probably only preached on it once or twice, um, not my favorite parable uh, as a pastor, simply because of all the bad ways to preach it. Um, as we approach this parable, then we're going to expect God to do something special and God to do something important and God to upend things. Uh, and not to rehearse too much into the next section here, but as we get into the meat of the sandwich, that's kind of where God is going. God, the son, Jesus is going here with this quote from Isaiah. Um, Look, if you all kind of figured it out, then we could just get on with it and it would be great. But you won't because you won't let your hearts and your expectations be ruled by the Father. So uh, I'll stop here for fear of trespassing too much on the Isaiah text, the meat of the sandwich. But know as we read this, the point is not to sort out the church and to say, oh yeah, you're one of the weedy people or you're one of the thorny people and, and good luck, God's blessings, uh, but you're you're not going to make it. Uh, the point is, again, to transfer form our understanding of how God works in the world and what we can expect out of him, which is from this parable, everything, everything miraculous. So here we come to the part of the parable uh, or the section in Mark where uh, things take a turn. And this is the meat of the parable. Uh, so we hear, and when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parable. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables so that they may indeed see, but not perceive and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. Okay, so what's going on here? Jesus is quoting from Isaiah at the bottom in verse 12. Uh, so, um, and he's not actually quoting directly from Isaiah, um, as we would understand it. He's quoting from the Targum. So this is a different Jewish source uh, where they've rendered it slightly differently, and Jesus picks up on it to uh, use his purpose. So that actually turns out to be... Um, kind of a fun little side fact, and I'll leave you to go research the Targum on your own uh, and to kind of go down that, that rabbit hole. Okay, so in the meat of this, Jesus is uh, going to explore several different themes. One of them is the insider-outsider theme. So he's got the 12, and he's setting the stage, and Mark is actually setting the stage for um, the idea that Jesus is a public ministry uh, which is uh, multifaceted, but involved in healing and miracle work and teaching broad numbers of people. And then he's got a uh, intentional internal discipleship program where he's taking these 12 guys and potentially the women who don't get numbered, but who we do have a sense of of who they are uh, and growing them, right? Think of Mary and Martha, growing them into be uh, the church leaders he needs them to be in the early church. So there's insiders out and outsiders, and there's always going to be insiders and outsiders. We will frequently pick the Pharisees and Sadducees, the opposition as his outsiders, uh, and they remain outsiders, but they don't show up in this story, right? These are faithful people who have shown up to hear Jesus talk, and it's been wonderful. Um, and we've kind of from the last one, gone off a little bit on, you know, the this rabble, this huge crowd with that's impolite that is pressing and pushing on him. Uh, you can be sure there's a Pharisee or two who's in there getting intelligence and sitting down to see if Jesus uh, and listen and see if Jesus is actually um, teaching good things or bad things or if there's just blasphemy all over the place they can charge him with. Um, so, but they aren't the, the outsiders. The outsiders here are the crowd, uh, which is going to be a little uncomfortable here because the insiders are always going to be the disciples or those coming and seeking faith. And, and we'll have a few more of those, but it's a little bit more clear in Luke's gospel. Um, but here we have uh, the crowd is the outsiders, and that's uncomfortable because often we're in the crowd. 
often we're the ones who are coming to Jesus to learn and to understand. And I think the discomfort is, um, think about it like this. All of the people who read the Bible liter- uh, as a literary book, right? They've read Moby Dick and they've read War and Peace and now it's onto the Bible so they can say they've read it. Uh, they would be in the crowd. Um, and those who are studying the Bible in small sections um, so they can understand certain points of view, they are in the crowd. Um, there is actually a whole bunch of biblical scholarship that's done by non-Christians. Um, there's just, you know, biblical interpretation, translating. You don't have to be a Christian to be a good translator, um, understanding Hebrew poetry and writing commentaries on it. You don't have to be a Christian to do that or a Jew even, although sometimes the Jewish translations and commentaries can be more interesting. Uh, just they're close, but just a little different. They have different things that they think of. Uh, but these folks would be in the crowd where Christians would be in the inner circle. So insiders and outsiders is one thing that's happening here. Um, uh, In regard to the people who uh, see but not perceive and hear but not understand, of course, we're upset by this because we keep thinking about um, what if that's Jesus saying some people he's intentionally trying to keep from going to heaven. And in Matthew and Luke's Gospels, they... um, they try to fix this, or not try to fix this, but they they uh, give a new, more nuanced reading and say, Jesus said this because it was the hardness of their hearts that caused them to not, not um, continue on uh, or to not understand. So um, Mark doesn't say that. Mark just kind of leaves that here. Um, but it is sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. The people who can never sit down and listen, the people who will never stop because they're just too busy, or the people who just shrug it off and that's just another prophet. Uh, so it does become self-fulfilling. So the weight of Jesus saying this in, in terms of intentionally trying to damn people is less uh, than we would expect. Um, so... Um, there's there's that that's sitting right there and we feel that a little bit uh the other gospels read into it that uh no no they were never going to listen anyway uh in mark it's not quite fair to say that it's it's that they were they're just not stopping um because he says hear the parable uh and um so that's going on On a deeper level, and a more offensive level, um, this is Jesus lining himself up with the prophets and saying, you know what, the prophets were sent with a mission to go and talk to the people of Israel, and the people of Israel never listened to them. Poor Isaiah, 66 chapters, and nobody's listening to Isaiah the entire time. Uh, And it's so bad uh, that Isaiah switches and stops talking about what's happening right now with Assyria and Babylon and, and Egypt and just starts talking about when God comes again. And that divide is really, really sharp. And so it's uh, the first book of Isaiah is book one, chapters one through 39. And then there's this split where Isaiah can't take it anymore. And here's a whole bunch of prophecies about the end times. Um, (laughs) And so Jesus says, you know, I, to the extent that, um, I am a prophet, uh, and we would go and, and talk about Jesus in a prophetic sense, right? He's prophet, priest, and king. He's all of those. This is one of those prophetic times when Jesus is actually, you know, doing the prophet thing. And he's saying, you know, that whole crowd there, I just preached a lengthy sermon to them, and uh, very few of them are going to take it to heart. Very few, a lot of them are there because they don't, we don't have TV yet, uh, or because they had the day off and they thought it'd be fun to take the wife and kids out to see this crazy guy. So there's a a realignment here in the text where he's signaling to the disciples, I'm a prophet. I'm an Old Testament prophet and I'm back. Um, This does not in any way preclude his divinity. It's just part of his office. Okay, so I'm not suggesting that he's only just another prophet. No, no, but he is a prophet. Uh, And the Son of God gets to be whatever he wants to be. Uh, It's part of being the Son of God. And so here today, he's a prophet. Uh, And so that's that's a reading. And I said offensively, because it is offensive to say, I'm another prophet and you guys have messed up enough and that God has sent down another prophet. And the offensive part is, and nobody's going to listen to me. 
Uh, and we see this kind of in a tragic arc, not so much in Mark, but in the other Gospels where he's having it out with the religious leaders and the people, the teachers of the law, and they just don't get it. And in a longer arc in the Gospels, again, with his disciples, where uh, his position very slowly dawns on them. So finally, one of the things and one of the reasons that I think this is interesting is because um, this little section here answers one of the questions, right? It's not the case that it to, to know the good is to do the good. That would be uh, Plato, Plato with a T, not D, not the, you know, the colorful child's toy, but Plato, the early philosopher around the 300s uh, BC, uh, who suggests that all you need to do to live a moral life is to know what's good. And then you'll just automatically do that. Um, no. <laughs> Have you met three-year-olds? They know what's good, and they just kind of look at it and smile and walk off the other way. Um, but it should be sufficient for the Son of God to come down, inspire belief in everybody, and the entire world is saved, and the Father can return, and everything's just peachy. But in this, Jesus is saying, no, that's not how this works. Uh, for a variety of reasons, um, I will come down, I will bring grace, I will bring bring truth and I will bring teaching and I will be largely rejected. And it doesn't matter even if the Son of God comes, we're not getting full 100% belief. Uh, and if you think about the parable of, of the bad tenants or the evil tenants, right? And they say that the bunch of bill collectors come, the the, the landowner is out uh, away in a foreign country, sends collector bill collectors to collect on his rent, and they beat him up and kill some and, and send some away, uh, beat up. And then he sends the son, and he says, surely they'll listen to the son. And the renters say, this is our chance. If we kill the son, then... Um, then he'll have to give the the uh, vineyard to us, and um, that that is where we're at. So it's not that you know Jesus comes and inspires faith in everybody. No, no. Uh, unfortunately, Jesus comes and inspires faith in a some small few, and we're waiting, uh, and it's going to be going to kind of come along here uh, as the church grows. So that's actually one of the, the more troubling kind of aspects to this. It's not that Jesus is intentionally trying to damn people by confusing them. Um, it is the case that the coming of the Son of God is insufficient to create belief in everybody. Um, and that should trouble everyone, that we can see God look him square in the face and say, yeah, I'm not down with that. Um, that's upsetting. That's the kind of what I think where we should stake the meat of this uh, in, in here uh, in terms of, look, I am the sower. Jesus is saying, I'm the sower. I'm sowing the word. And then the meat is, but some of you are mor morons. And I'm going to double this down and say, some of you refuse to believe, not just that it, for whatever reason, the seed fell and it didn't take. It's some of you spat the seed back out. Um, and that's upsetting. That's something that just should not be. Finally, um, in the midst of all of this is a greater kind of a theme in terms of insiders and outsiders and in terms of the mission of the Christ. Um, he needs chronologically, if this is year one or year two, um, and that remains to be seen, um, we're unsure, right? Mark pulls teaching uh, kind of willy-nilly from the inside of Jesus' ministry to prove a larger point, which is fantastic. It's fine. It's, it's not a wanting a chronological moment-by-moment -moment account as a Western thing. There's nothing wrong with Mark's doing this. Um, but there is the chronological necessity in the revelation of Christ such that the Pharisees and Sadducees and teachers of the law can't figure out who Jesus is too early and then murder him at the wrong time. Right. We just I'm filming this or recording this just two days after Easter, uh, and it does need to be Passover for a variety of reasons. It does need to be. He is the Passover lamb, the the, the sacrifice, uh, and it, we do need that. Uh, so it can't be too early. Uh, and so there is a little bit of sense of Jesus saying a little bit of mystery now will be OK. Um, I don't think that chronological necessity is what we should use as our 
as our interpretive uh, winnowing fork or interpretive sorter um, for a lot of things. Like that shouldn't be our, our go to. Sometimes it clearly is when Jesus is healing people early in his ministry and tells them to be silent about it. Um, but here it really is just because Jesus is here um, doesn't mean it's going to inspire belief. And and we'll stop talking about this with this little story. Um, the great uh, radio and then TV interviewer, um, oh, now I've forgotten his name, Larry King. There we go. Uh, I just had a picture of him in his spenders and tie that match and then his collared, his white collared and white cuff shirt, right? That's, that's his standard, standard wear every day for his interviews, right? He was asked once, Larry King was asked one, if you could interview one person throughout all of history, who would that be? And Larry King said, Jesus. And my first question would be, are you the son of God? Backing back up to our point here before, it's not enough. It's never enough. Even if Jesus shows himself in glory, um, as he did in the transfiguration, it's not enough. Some people will still be looking in the background for the slide projector or the, the, the whatever, you know, the spotlights that we've hidden uh, to kind of do the special effects. Um, and so... Um, that story kind of always reminds me, you know, of course we want to interview Jesus and he should be at the top of everybody's list because he's one of the more interesting figures historically, just as a person and, and doubling down on his humanity. But we really need to stress that. And the meat here is that the word gets sown and some won't believe. And me being the good and the perfect sower, Jesus says, is not going to be enough. Um, I don't want to go down at this point. Later on, I probably will. The discussion of determinism and free will um, and free will in human matters and free will in spiritual matters. Um, but suffice to say, Jesus as the Son of God's presence is insufficient to create true belief here, even though he is the perfect sower and the perfect farmer uh, and the perfect shepherd. All right, so we're back now with the very last of our um, part of Mark here for this week, and this has taken a little bit more time um, to get out. It's now a few days further than I was before. Uh, suffice to say that um, it's been a long Easter, and I just can't keep cranking out product as quickly as I was before uh, without burnout and without uh, attending to other things. So... Uh, we're back here now with our um, bit from Mark here, um, starting at the 13th verse, where Jesus gives us the explanation. And um, here, academically, uh, there's not as much to go on here, right? And we've already kind of talked about some of the things that are... Um, kind of we could have talked about here in terms of, of um, information organization, right? The bit about normal farming yields. And um, then in the last time I talked or the last slide or, or whatever earlier I talked about um, uh, what you're supposed to do with this parable and uh, where you're supposed to go with it. Also, if you don't know, I'm producing this in um, PowerPoint. Uh, and then Ryan uh, is upgrading the audio for us and we're having it as a movie uh, or as a podcast. So uh, if you hear me say slide, it, that's why, because what you see on your screen, if you're doing this on a screen thingy, uh, really is actually for me right now a slide. So uh, hopefully that doesn't undo or unwrite your, your uh, awe of my technological mastery and wizardry here. Uh, really, I'm not the wizard. I'm the front man for Ryan, uh, who happens to be the wizard. So Wave at the people, Ryan. All right. So you can kind of read through here and you get the explanation that you all expect because we've all read this uh, before, but uh, we get through here. Um, and, you know, when you read through this and you spiritualize it as Jesus does, because that's what you're supposed to do with the parable on the initial reading before you wander off to find other things to do with the parable that are profitable, um, you get uh, exactly what you would expect, and you get um, what reason tells you is going to happen, 
when you get new ad- adopters, right? And so it doesn't surprise us at all that the one of the explanations is that life situations choke out people's new faith. Well, we see that. And we see that not just with faith, but we also see that in terms of um, people's ability to keep on that couch to 5k run uh, program or to put down the tub of ice cream or to stop smoking, right? This shouldn't surprise us that that early adoption of Jesus and and, and and being a follower of the way, as it was known before it was termed Christianity, um, that those sorts of things are really just, um, sometimes they get dropped. And um, again, that some people go really hard and really fast because they love it, and then they just kind of peter out. Um, so there's something to be said for that, right? And one of the things that the church has done poorly um, because life's hard and we've got a million things that we're supposed to be doing. But one of the things we've done poorly is to be able to come alongside those who are having their faith choked out by, um, the weeds and the vines. Uh, we're less able to come up and say, Hey, that heroin is really making it hard for you to believe in Jesus or that family situation. And in the early church, uh, it was as soon as you became a Christian, either you decided to leave your family and your job because they were going to blackball you and kick you out anyway, uh, or you didn't. And in America, in the 21st, 20th and 21st century, uh, we kind of have it really, really easy. And so you can kind of float in and out. Um, and church is so delighted to see you that they don't really double down a lot of the time on, hey, you got to knock this off and you got to choose between church and your crummy family or church and this, this insatiable love you have for, for, um, uh, chicken fried steak benders or whatever it happens to be that is driving you from Jesus and the gospel, although chicken fried steak is delicious. Um, so, you know, um, <laughs> we don't do that well. And we also don't do well the long marathon. In fact, whole church denominations, and here I'm going to be Lutheran for a second, whole church denominations are really capitalizing on the short sprinters. Um, and I'm not going to name names here, but I will say um, there are some denominations where the average stay in the denomination is three years. The people come to Jesus, they go to that big church um, or that little church, depending on how it is, uh, and they stay and they last about three years because that's a sprint for them. And um, they're winded. And at the end, they say, well, I did the Christianity thing. And then they're out. So we don't do this very well. So um, one of the things that I am excited about or that I've been excited about has been involved in ministries with and partnership with ministries that seek to come alongside those who have, especially those whose lives and circumstances have choked the gospel out and to get them back into church and back into faith. Um, and I'd like to do partnerships with churches where essentially they're the front door uh, uh, into the Christian faith, and then they have a back door and an intentional back door uh, that that goes into the um, goes into uh, a denominational church, which tends to. I said I wasn't going to name names, but generally those tend to be more marathon churches and not sprint churches. But um, of course, it's offensive to everybody to get called to sprint church and to suggest that you know that you guys are are uh, soulless, happy, uh, joyless marathoners, or you guys are are kind of flaky sprinters, and and to have that intentional conversation it, again across denominational lines, which is a big ask these days, um, uh, to take other people on faith and and to kind of let things go. But um, that's just my two cents for Christian for our Christian world, such as it is um, in the 21st century here in America. Uh, So then I want to get down to verse 20, because verse 20 is really uh, the meat of it. And again, from my previous comments where I derided other pastors in certain sermons, um, take that with a grain of salt, although my criticism is still there, uh, and I think it's still valid. Um, So please don't make me sit through another one of those sermons about how I'm the you know, the, the sprinter. Um, but down here in verse 20, it says others like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it and produce a crop some 30, 60 and some a hundred times what was sown. Okay. So the Lutherans just put a pin in the accept it business. Um, if you're an adult convert, there's an existential experience of conversion. Just roll with it heaven forbid that Jesus get to talk like a normal human being instead of a 19th century German theologian. Um, 
But this is where we're headed, right? And this is the whole meat of the parable. It's not to single out the other people. It's to talk about the work of God in his kingdom and how awesome this is going to be. Uh, and if you'll run with God uh, and run with the gospel and do the things that Jesus asks you to do, there's some fruit. And there's a lot of fruit, uh, way more than we expected. And again, the point, the overarching point in all of this is God's going to work in your life and is going to bless the socks off of you and is going to do way more than you ever could have. Uh, so this isn't prosperity gospel. This is Jesus saying, if you just let me go with the gospel and let me do my thing, I will be able to accomplish amazing things through you. And again, think back to those people who work tirelessly for the Lord. Uh, we'll suggest the late and great and much uh, mourned Billy Graham, um, as well as the late, great, and much mourned Mother Teresa. Um, these are our two 21st century, 20th century saints or 21st century. Um, they were sainted before death. Um, but these are the two out coming out of the, the last hundred years that pretty much all Christians of all stripes can say, yeah, that's a saint. Uh, all theology of saint, sainthood and, and, and that kind of stuff aside, those two are saints. Uh, and look at what they did. It's not a hundred times on both of them. It's 10,000 times or more. Um, and so just know that, uh, at the end, this hundred times is a, a Jewish number of completion. He's not saying just a hundred times. It's a mind blowing, uh, mind boggling amount. Um, and again, even today, right? People are inspired and brought to faith by the story of Billy Graham or the story of Mother Teresa and all that they did or from firsthand accounts, right? I went to that, that gospel presentation of Billy Graham in 1975 and was, was changed. And I've been a Christian ever since I, I worked with Mother Teresa and this is what she taught me. And this is what, what's uh, empowering or uh, life-changing uh, for me. Or um, from Indians, I was one of the least of these and Mother Teresa loved me. Um, so again, um, you have the Holy Spirit. Uh, most of you uh, who are listening are good um, every Sunday going Christians, except this is coronavirus time. So um going digitally, uh, we hope and pray. And uh, that is it, right? That expect this out of God, that God wants to do this and work um, in this. Don't expect for material blessings, where I'm not Joel Osteen, um, to name names. Um, I am suggesting that it's the little things that ripple along through um, and that God uses to do great and amazing things. This is wrapping up our uh, time here and our podcast. So God's blessings to you in this week. And again, uh, thank you to Ryan Philbrook, my producer and uh, magician and now wizard, apparently. So uh, Ryan, you got an upgrade. Uh, hopefully you get to roll a few more dice uh, for that upgrade. Um, and uh, have a great week and God's blessings to you. The handshake might be dead, but human touch doesn't have to be. The Hands Washing Station offers you a real human connection while ensuring clean, virus-free skin. Just turn on the faucet and a pair of human hands will emerge, ready to soap you up and wash you down, getting in between your fingers and underneath those pesky nails. Studies show that 20 seconds of hand washing effectively kills bacteria and viruses, and the Hands Washing Station won't let you go until you're done. Human touch without the fear of transmission. Call for pricing or visit handswashingstation.com today. That's handswashingstation.com. Hands, H-A-N-D-S.